Hello and welcome to Season 4, Episode 10 of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. And we are, of course, reading Alan Ryan's On Politics, a book summarizing the history of political theory from the ancient Greeks to the modern day. And this time we are covering humanism. Uh, So last time we covered the 14th century and what was going on with the church and state. And now we're moving somewhat into the Renaissance, somewhat into the Reformation um, with a lot of thinkers there. And so this this topic will be on humanism uh, for this episode. What were your thoughts overall? What do you think of this chapter just broadly before we get into it? I don't think it's very much political philosophy. Mm. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of like just general philosophy. Right, right. But I, enjoyed I, it. I thought it was a good chapter. Yeah, I mean, I do enjoy the book. This one, I'm like, well, okay, why do we why do we have a separate chapter on human? I mean, it's important for philosophy, but I don't know about, about political philosophy. Although I guess it kind of goes to the more to the tone or the emphasis than you know, the actual political philosophy structure, whatever you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. True. I mean, I think it's like tangentially related. I think a lot of this is looking at how we can apply the humanist, just regular philosophy to politics and not necessarily what they had to say about politics. Correct. Yes. That's a good point. Thank you. Should we just get right into it? Yes. All right. So he starts off with the big question of what was humanism? And so he kind of says at the very beginning of this chapter that the next three chapters, and so our next three episodes, consider the political ideas of one period of time. Um, This is after the mid-16th century when there was a big divide between Catholics and Protestants, and there's as well as a difference in political history and political aspirations between those two groups. Uh, He says an analysis of humanism is not easy. Uh, It's some, uh, excuse me, Some detect a political movement called civic humanism sparked by the reading of classical morals, Uh, so political texts, um, and so these were committed to Republican virtues, and there was a revival centered on Florence and its image as a self-governing republic, Uh, but critics of that say humanists were less interested in politics and more with establishing reliable texts of Latin and Greek literature, Uh, and so there was a connection with, uh, the connection with Republican virtue was doubtful, as many humanists admired tradition and hierarchy. Um, So kind of a distinction there between, you know, what humanism is and what it means to the political world. He says humanism originated in the need for educated lawyers. You needed dictatores at this time, which were men who drafted documents, uh, wrote contracts and handled government correspondence. And so they needed to write well. And so they became very familiar with literary texts, breeding an interest in its quality as literature. So then therefore we had more sophisticated and philological approach to authorship and interpretation. The humanist writers often use novel literary forms to discuss politics, particularly utopias, in the short polemical essay, uh, and they conventionally described uh, as a literary movement that started with Petrarch, emphasizing poetry and literature. Uh, Another description of this is to look at the opposition to scholasticism, and that might be the determining factor in what humanism is. Uh, The humanists had a great desire to escape syllogistic formalism and reduction of all moral and political questions to issues in theology. Uh, but he kind of ends by saying that deciding who is and isn't a humanist isn't easy. This chapter begins with Christine de Pizan and emphasizes Thomas More. Uh, so there's a bunch of different opinions of what humanism really is and what it means for the political world. A lot of lawyers. A lot of lawyers, yes. A lot of lawyers and legally speaking and the training and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, the drafting of documents that he's talking about is like the bane of my existence, but a lot of my practice. Yeah. So that's, that's what I was thinking when I, when I read that, I figured, you know, you would have a connection there because that's a lot of what you do. <laughs> yes. And, um, and you enjoy it greatly. Um, I hate it. I hate the <laughs> transaction side of it. It's, it's pushing papers, Yeah, but uh, it's important work, you know, I mean, and you have, you, you do have to be able to write, you know, to a certain degree and, yeah. and, um, uh, I don't have I don't have a flourish, so I don't I don't use any literary techniques. Uh, yeah. But you do have to turn the phrase. Like I was just, I was drafting a rather unique contract today at work, and and you have to figure out a way to be precise mm-hmm. and uh, and also broad enough so that it it has enough meaning between the parties. And sometimes yeah. it's hard, but uh, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. You know, t- they're talking about those kind of. Uh, uh, how, how that developed developed the philosophy at the time, because you know when you have more educated or you know uh, more knowledgeable uh, attorneys, and they have to have to write things, then you then you start going you know get into a different kind of level of thought mm-hmm. about okay what are the relationships between these people and what is a, a you know what's the value of 
this versus that and how to do how do you uh, write the transaction so that everybody's uh intent is fulfilled i just thought um, it was interesting because i'd almost expect the opposite to come from that because you know because they were so much opposed to like the syllogistic you know formalism and stuff like that you would think that being trained in the law they would much prefer like the type of writing that like if this then that but instead it bred like a big interest in literature and i feel like you wouldn't expect that especially not today you don't really associate lawyers with reading like you know poetic literature and stuff like that it's more so you know the very cut and dry documents yeah and i think i think it was a different practice though then okay. so that they they had to have that they, they you know when they're there it, it wasn't as established or cut and dry as it is now mm -hmm. but you, you have some of the most well-read uh, people in the world and the most articulate people in the world that are trial lawyers. Mm -hmm. So if you're in front of a jury and, and uh, I remember an old guy who's passed away now, Brunson Hollingsworth, that uh, used to talk about the hills, of, the people of the hills of Jefferson County. <laughs> and and he'd be able to quote the Bible, old chapter and verse. And, oh. and, uh, and, 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 you know, like, like you'd think of an old country lawyer. Yeah. His son is a, is a, an attorney about my age, I think. Interesting. Uh, and he he has a he has a way he he's very very smart and very uh, knowledgeable uh, about history especially and mm -hmm. he he likes to pepper his legal arguments with uh, historical references if nothing else then uh, just out of entertainment <laughs> uh, but but for himself you know um, so yeah you do see you do see a lot of that but it it's in a different different um, focus or emphasis because. Mm -hmm. You, you don't want to have that kind of literary flair yeah. in a transactional, like a contra lease for, you know, a commercial building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I guess you could. It's like those, those recipe blogs online where they tell you their entire life story before getting to like the recipe. It's, it's like right. exactly that. Right. I first cooked this when I was a five-year-old with my grandma's kitchen. <laughs> Jesus, give me the ingredients, lady. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to the first uh, thinker that we're looking at here, and that is Christine de Pizan. And he mentions that she's very unique as she's one of the few well-regarded women, uh, women writers in the late Middle Ages. Uh, she was born around 1363 and died sometime after 1480. She made a living by writing as her father was a royal employee, but both he and her husband died soon after her marriage at 16. And through her connection with her father, she had friends at court that made writing uh, for royal families a possibility. Uh, so her life spanned the worst period of the Hundred Years' War between France and England. She was born as Charles V began to restore French forces, and died. Um, uh, but he died prematurely and was succeeded by his son Charles VI, who was plagued by bouts of insanity, and the resulting infighting made France ungovernable, and Christine died just as the French were starting to get the upper hand, uh, as inspired by Joan of Arc, and her last known work was a speech in praise of Joan of Arc herself, um, but then she died soon after that. Uh, she became famous for the Book of the City of Ladies and the Book of the Three Virtues, uh, but our focus here is on the Book of the Body Politic. Uh, the City of Ladies uh, exemplified the humanist conviction that God and reason are on the same side, and therefore women can be as virtuous as men. And so that's kind of how she's known today as almost a, one of the first feminist writers in a way. Um, and then the Book of the Body Politic was written around 1407, and it was an advice book to the then Dauphine, uh, Louis of Guyenne, and it concerns the whole body politic, uh, but uh, the, the prince, the nobility, and the universal pe uh, people, but most of the book is spent on the prince. And the idea of the body politic goes back to Plato. Christine's metaphor is that the ruler is the head, the knights and the nobles are the active element, being the chest, arms, and hands, and the common people are the belly, legs, and feet, as they are devoted to creating the means of subsistence. So part of the book is an exhortation to the three estates of the French cities in Paris, particularly to cooperate and preserve unity. So it's not just like a training book for this prince. It's also, you know, hey, French people, we need to come together. Or we're going to get destroyed in this war. Um, and she was largely concerned with the education of the prince. As the Dauphine was 11 at the time, uh, the prince should entrust his son to a good scholar, uh, but a virtuous one before a merely wise one. He should learn classical wisdom, uh, which combined Christian and Ciceronian virtues, and he should learn the importance of justice, courage, temperance, and prudence. And the book has a very human touch. Uh, she insists that the pre prince's teacher must be sober, cleanly dressed, and not given to talking nonsense, and the prince must be allowed to play games and be given treats. Uh, she was also very critical of the decayed state of the church. Uh, the prince is told to look to the good of the whole people, not just his own, um, and so she then attacks uh, some of the clergy, and I'm going to read here from the book. 
But the ferocity of her attack on the misconduct of clergy and bishops who have shamed themselves in their religion by turning their churches into something closer to stables than temples has the ring of real anger. They are truly devils in the infernal abyss, for as the mouth of hell may never be filled nor satisfied, no matter how much it receives or takes, neither can their desires be satisfied or filled, since they have such great greed in them for money and luxuries, for which they do great evil to the people. She was writing in the 29th year of the Great Schism, and her anger is not inexplicable. And so, therefore, you know, looking at this greed, looking at this corruption with this message of, you know, don't just do everything for yourself. Uh, she had a lot of sympathy with the common people. She had a strong sense that their lives matter and their well-being should be the main concern of the elite. Uh, but she gives them little to no political role. Um, she was un in unchristian in her discussions of virtues and the obligations of knights. Uh, she, in fact, relies entirely on pagan and classical examples, uh, saying that you should obtain honor only by displaying courage, perseverance and indifference to the financial payoff of uh, military victory. So this should be something that's pursued, but only in the interest of honor. Um, and she had a ready acceptance of the savagery of Roman behavior in battle, but she also plead, pled for peace uh, many times. So kind of a mixed bag, um, an interesting uh, look at her, kind of as like a, a very common person uh, looking like at what a, a prince should do in his conduct and things like that. I thought this was, this was some interesting thoughts here. Yeah, I don't know. There was that that different than what other people have said. I mean, maybe a different flavor of it. You know, I I, I like the summary of I've never heard this of this person before. He said, "So it's my fault for being ignorant of her." Uh, and I do like you know you know her theme of you know that you can't uh, obtain honor. You can only obtain honor by deserving it. You know that you can't. Uh, you, you you're not automatically given it to you as a as a title or along with the title. And, um, you know, in the, you know, the theory of, or the analogy of the uh, politics or the, the political system being like a, a body is, is just really tough to, to pull off, I think, you know, like with the, I guess the, the king or, you know, the, the higher echelons are the head and then, you know, the knights are the arms and, you know, I guess the people are the feet and who's, who's the big toe? I don't know, you know. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, the, the guy that runs the shop, I guess, you know, I don't know. <laughs> What's the guy with an armory? And then you start wondering, well, what, what, you say, what about those other parts, you know, that nobody wants to really talk about in public? Who's that? <laughs> uh, who's the hair? I don't know. Um, so I, I, I just, I, I never preferred that uh, other than kind of a general, very vague analogy. But, uh, um, you know, I, I, I sympathize with their criticisms of the church at the time and i think that's uh, resonates today as we've talked about a lot in this this particular season yes, of, of course um but i you know it doesn't say too I mean, it's really just like um similar to what, what plato was talking about and, and, and aristotle about you know a, a properly educated monarch you know that, that a young uh, person to be a king, you know, has to have the right advisors and the right educational system and, and, you know, have the right ideals. And yeah. it doesn't seem groundbreaking to me. I mean, it just seems like, okay, yeah, she wrote yeah. pretty much what other people have already written and other people will write after her. Yeah. I think the most interesting part about it is that human touch uh, that I mentioned, because I feel like when, when we've read about a lot of these other people, it's like, you know, you need to learn the classical virtues and, you know, philosopher Kings and all that stuff. But she, you know, goes, you know, out of her way to mention, you know, this is still a kid, you know, let him let him play games, let him have treats and stuff like that. And I feel like that's that's important too. just a reminder that these people, you know, are still people. Um, They're not some, you know, divine, you know, sent from the heavens ruler that, you know, is right about everything. Like just reminding us that, you know, this is still a human being here. And yeah, that's, like that. yeah, that's a good point. And also she emphasized the uh, the common people that they have a value so that's separate from just being subjects. You know, there's a value to the king to have the subjects. But the, the people in and of themselves, the common people, have a value um, that's separate from that that relationship. So that's good too. Yeah. Yes, I like that a lot. We then move on to later humanists and Pico's oration. Uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, quite a mm -hmm. character, uh, Pico della Mirandola, uh, who was born in 1463 and died in 1494. And he wrote an oration at the age of 24 as part of his offer to prove 900 theses in every topic in logic, metaphysics, theology, and natural history before the College of Cardinals. Um, I think that's quite a challenge that he gave himself. Uh, very, very big undertaking. Uh, but he was an aristocrat who renounced his share of the family uh, duchy to pursue a life of learning. 
And so he believed in eclecticism, which is the idea that truth could be elicited by bringing together all possible intellectual, spiritual, and religious traditions. And so he believed in the supposed Egyptian magus, uh, Hermes Trismegistus, and uh, Chaldean theology and Jewish Kabbalistic teaching, uh, but he was still a devout Christian. Uh, and so he wrote the on the dignity of man, which brings up the interesting idea that God told men to go back and make himself the highest and most intelligent thing he can. Uh, and so that's really what Pico sees as, as the goal of mankind, to make himself the highest and most intelligent thing. Uh, and he was later condemned for heresy, not for this, uh, but 13 claims on the nature of transubstantiation, eternal punishment, um, and the idea that Christ had not really been present in his descent uh, to hell. Uh, he also believed that because God hadn't given man a specific physical defense, he needed to rely on intelligence to flourish and therefore had to invent political community and practice justice. He says human perfection is not something to be promoted politically. Um, you know, that's really just politics is just our defense mechanism to survive. We can't really be our perfect person there. He says that theology could bring us to a direct division, direct vision of the divine. We could make ourselves cherubim, which were close enough to God to contemplate him. Um, but really, the political implications of this are obscure. Um, so interesting character. Um, I don't know how much, you know, political philosophy he had. I'd never heard of him before, um, yeah. but very entertaining to read about at the very least. Sounds like uh, a guy that I'd like to interview. <laughs> uh, yeah, a very uh, interesting thoughts about uh, how much you can know, you know, that that, you, that just by um, studying and, and contemplating it, that you can get uh, close to a vision of God mm -hmm. uh, that, that's either uh very uh he, he was going to work very hard at it or he's very arrogant you know that that, that could be done mm -hmm. uh yeah just uh, uh, kind of a fascinating s story about him and, and about um you know his his thoughts and and, and, and i don't know if you taught, uh, talked about it or referenced it where he's, he's talking about like the the animals have like like a lion has claws mm -hmm. And and these weapons for, of survival, we just have our intelligence, and so that's why we have we have the ability to um, to understand these concepts and have a political structure, and then also to uh, become better people. But the political structure isn't isn't the same as a moral mm -hmm. uh, benefit, you know. So th that's a that's a practical side, but that's not how you that's not how society becomes perfect. Which I I'm trying to remember is that uh, is that Aristotle. Uh, that was, you know, saying if you have the right system, that, that you know, this, this idea that you're pushing towards a, a mm -hmm. perfect, more, more perfect union, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, and so, so it, it seems like he's just saying that, you know, you need to study it and think about it to get a, a better version of your political system, but it's not going to give you moral uh, improvement just to have a better political system, if I, if I remember it correctly. Yeah. Would you agree with that assessment? I would agree with that assessment. I, I think that's very true. Um, I, when I was reading this, I also liked the bit about, you know, him trying to prove 900 theses. I feel yeah. like that's something that you would do if out of spite, you would not do it willingly. You would not go out of your way with this idea. But if a college of cardinals said that you could not do it, I feel like you would. Well, in my youth, you know, yeah. I'm, I, I, now I'd get tired after about two dozen. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I was a go getter back when I was in my <laughs> in 20s. I went, I, 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 good thing I didn't hear about him because I probably would have found those. You, yeah, know? you would have written 901 theses. That's exactly <laughs> what you would have done. You would have written 900 disproving his and then one right. extra one just to put you on top. Right. Yes, I'd, I'd do something like that. Something arrogant and also uh, pointless. Yes, I, exactly. you know, one of the things I used to do is, uh, uh, I used to write in bureaucraties. That's what oh. I called it, unnecessarily opaque and uh, uh, and long-winded uh, uh, language. So, like, instead of if you say he went there, you know, just that very simply, you know, you, you'd say you use thirty words to say the exact same thing. Yes. I've got a lot of redundancies, and, and actually, is I'm gonna have to go back to that because uh, <laughs> I, I it amused me to a great deal. Um, <laughs> and uh, it also helped me write my papers because uh, I would uh, I would write papers and they always be like a page. Uh, we didn't have word counts because we didn't have a word. The mm -hmm. word program didn't exist, so it didn't automatically. You didn't have a program to count your 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 words. You'd have pages, and so then you can fudge around with your margins a little bit uh, if it, without it being detected too much. <laughs> Or your spacing, if you can, if you had a sophisticated enough, it was word perfect back then, mm -hmm. uh, or the predecessor. 
uh, to whatever that whatever that was and um and so if you can if you could say something one way and you could just add it like double the words to say yeah. the same thing well then you just you just pad your paper and you you said everything but and of course what you should always do is come to the conclusion first and then do your research to support it <laughs> which really speeds things up <laughs> you've told me about that i, I don't think it's a bad way, <laughs> way to go about things honestly i mean if, if you're not designing your own experiment well i mean even then like even if it is like an experiment type thing, then you would still be planning your your questions around the thing that you're hoping to find. So I feel like well, it would yeah, make it easier. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean that's why you're supposed to do science. You're yes. supposed to have a hypothesis, yeah. and then you then you do the research, and, and then you come to a conclusion. Yes. But I would just come to a firm conclusion <laughs> and then work my way backwards. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's that's, and, that's uh, yeah. The, it would really become a problem if I prove myself wrong after mm -hmm. I've already, you know, written the uh, introduction and the conclusion. I'm just trying to fill <laughs> in the middle of it. And then I'm like, oh, dang it. I got to, all right, I got to reverse this. So I got to go not uh, <laughs> <laughs> my conclusion. Uh, but anyway, so, yeah, but I, I, I liked his, uh, 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 I liked his, uh, uh, his spunk, you know, where he's going to, do 900 theses now i don't know what the topics were you know are these really yeah. simple things or is this, a, is this a couple pages or is it like and you never did complete it so mm. you know, died very young i guess it's, it's just 900, usually... 900 theses of like simple math facts like he has one plus one equals two all the way up to like 900 and that that's oh, maybe that's what it is yeah, yeah. That, that sounds more uh, uh, sounds more doable yeah exactly but I, I do like how he was uh you know condemned or whatever it was for his you know I, 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 I always I always find it funny when we're reading this history of philosophy, how many of these guys got murdered. Well, we're going to see one here in a, a little bit later in the chapter. Yeah, no kidding. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, people complain in modern world about, oh my gosh, they uh, censored my tweet, uh, <laughs> which is not good. You know, I'm not, yes. I'm not advocating for, I'm a, I'm a free speech guy, but boy, it was a whole different world back then. You know, you said the wrong thing about the Pope and they're going to, they're going to kill you. You mm -hmm. know, and or the king or whatever. I mean, that's a death sentence. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anywho, moving along. Yes, moving on to Erasmus. Um, and this was a long section, so feel free to to interrupt me uh, whenever you want because I have a I have some notes on here. Wow, why are you going so much? He seemed to write a lot about Erasmus, and I don't know what what was the point of Erasmus. Well, he had a lot of different points. I think we'll we'll get. Yeah, into I guess so. The utopia. Of course, I have such disdain for utopian thoughts. Yes, well, that's that's Thomas More. Yeah, but this didn't this guy talk about it or is it pre Sam trying to remember? All right, can I just move into yes, it. Then we'll, we'll go into it. Uh, he was born in 1409 as the illegitimate son of a future priest and a physician's daughter. Uh, and he was a native of the Netherlands, uh, but he could not afford university and so pursued his studies in a monastery uh, and then began a career searching for patrons after becoming the secretary of the Bishop of Cambrai in 1492. Uh, he wrote The Education of a Christian Prince in 1516. Uh, and in this, he insisted that peace is the highest good, uh, despite being written for monarchs who became notable uh, practitioners of war. Uh, but his pacifism was really sincere, and his hatred of war was shared by his good friend Thomas More. He claims that there is something beyond human nature, something wholly divine, an absolute rule over free and willing subjects. So he was still in favor of monarchy. He said that good rulers display a divine quality that would be absurd to restrain, but they can display it only by ruling over consenting subjects. Just the the king is supreme in his wisdom, and you you had to figure that was pretty revolutionary thought at the time. You know, to say that you can, that the king can only um, properly rule or legitimately rule if the people consented to it, and you know you didn't have elections back then. Yeah, you know, so it be it's a dangerous thing to advocate when when you've got the monarch's ear. You know, to say well you can only rule legitimately if you have the consent of the people and of course the king would say well who's objecting and i hear any objections well then they consented uh <laughs> step forward if you're not consenting well i, I think uh, it kind of combines like the two ideas there very well like in terms of the time because if he had outright said you know the king has no authority or no you know talent beyond what he's given by the people then he absolutely would have been killed but he does say you know he does have a divine power there is something innate within him which would have pleased the king very much but he says but it can only be exercised properly over consenting people. So I think it's a good mix of the two that he accomplishes there. True. Good point. Thank you. Uh, he then goes You're on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Um, and this is very similar to Plato's desire for a philosopher kings. He says a philosopher is not someone who is a clever at dialectics or science, but someone who can distinguish reality and appearance. 
and unflinchingly cleaves to the good. He also says that being a philosopher is the same thing as being a Christian, but the terminology is different. He says that Stoics argued only that only the virtuous man, man was free because only he can spurn the temptations of the flesh and steer by the compass of natural uh, virtue. And then the Christian argues that the joys of the world are snares and delusions. And so he kind of says that, you know, these are the same things, just in different words. So you can be this, this Christian, you can be this philosopher king. You know, we're kind of been saying the, the same things in different ways over thousands of years. He also talks about the dangers of flattery. He says, true praise is good for it encourages activity in the path of virtue, but the prince must beware of advisors who always tell him what he wants to hear, um, generally because they always want something in return. He says that there's a difference between tyrants and legitimate rulers as well. And in this, he adheres to the old view that consent of the subject legitimizes the ruler. Monarchy is the best form of government, uh, but tyrants govern in their own self-interests and try to force obedience on subjects. And so then, you know, kind of drawing from this, he says that moderate taxation is best. A lightly taxed people would be more prosperous and provide greater resources for the government than people who can barely keep themselves alive. And he also says that excessive taxes inspire revolts. I think that's still true to this day that, you know, a lightly taxed people is, is probably for the best. And well, and, yeah. And, and, um, you know, 10% uh, of a lot is, is a whole lot more than, uh, 50% of a very little or mm-hmm. nothing, you know, yeah. and that, that's the idea is, is that, you know, you can, you can raise the taxes, but if, if it destroys the, their ability to feed themselves, um, it, you certainly aren't going to have the resources to feed an army because there's mm-hmm. going to be no excess. And so, yeah, it's a good point. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. He also says that lawfulness is essential. He says the legitimate priest does not allow his friends to break the law and makes no exceptions save what clemency demands. He does not pr- pr- uh, praise or forbid tyrannicide, uh, but he reminds rulers who uh, alienate their subjects that they risk their lives. But again, he does not praise this revolt. So he kind of walks the middle line there of not saying, you know, it's a good thing to kill the ruler. It's just that the ruler has to beware because it could happen to him, you know, whether it's a good thing or not. Right. And what do you think? You know, we keep seeing this over and over again in this era. Well, and really before this era, but mm-hmm. that the the argument that a monarchy, a sole ruler, is the most efficient or effective way to have uh, a political system. But what are your thoughts on that? I don't think you've uh, you've really I don't know shared it. I mean, it's so foreign to what we have now. You know, uh, do you think they have a good point? I mean, I think it would be the most efficient. I don't think it would be the best necessarily. I mean, if you have one person with all of the power, then all the decision-making processes would be a lot easier because it's him making the decisions. Um, and I do agree, of course, you know, if you do have this person with all this power, he needs advisors, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, I, I, I can't seem to find like a fault in that logic that it would be the most efficient. I mean, yeah. look at politics now where it has to go, you know, through three different layers of bureaucracy for for, for more than that, probably for anything to happen. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I don't think it's the best. And I think, you know, taking the time can almost be a good thing in some circumstances. I don't think efficiency 100% equals the best in certain things. I think things like the DMV could use like a monarch and just, you know, speed things up there. But um, I, I don't think, you know, general, you know, what what government is supposed to do should be done by, you know, one person alone. Mm. Interesting. What yeah. The, the, uh, well, I was, um, um, I, I think, and it sounds like you're like Tom Friedman talking about the Chinese there, you know, like, oh, it'd be so much more efficient if, yeah. if we didn't have all this uh, messy democracy because he's, <laughs> you know, they have light rail and they built this building in, in one week and we can't do that here. And, That's what I'm saying. That's why I'm saying like, you know, it, I don't think it's 100% a, a good thing because, you know, if the king, you know, has all this power and he does something that the subjects don't want him to do, there's nothing to stop him. I think by having, you know, the, the right. checks and stuff on that, you know, and the time that it takes to do that is a good thing in the long run because it, you know, helps the people themselves more than the the monarch. Yeah, I kind of think. Well, I guess it depends on how big of a system you're talking about. Yeah, uh, and, and if it's a small enough system where the the king can know the the major variables, I guess it makes mm-hmm. sense. But when you have uh, like a country the size of the United States, for example, that's an entire length of a continent, you know, from left to right, or east, you know, east to west, or west to east. And you have 300 million people in there and all these other transactions. There's no way to have enough information to make the right decision. Mm-hmm. And so you almost have to have it diffuse. And, you, and and that's an argument to have more local control rather than have one person at the top making the ultimate decisions. And it's more, it's more efficient to make the decision 
but I don't know that it's a it's a more efficient system to get to the correct decision. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I agree, right. and I think I think they kind of understand that a lot of these thinkers do because I think they all prioritize wisdom almost anything else. I mean, some you know different virtues, but wisdom is definitely one of the key features of all of these you know people who say monarchy is the best. And I think they realize that the king has to know just about everything that is going on and what is the right, right decision in every circumstance for this to work. You know, hypothetically speaking, if the king is, you know, supremely wise, then it is the best system. Right. And it, it's kind of like the analogy um, of the argument about um, programming mm -hmm. uh, or data, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So if, if you put the wrong data into a program, you're going to get the wrong answer. Yeah. And, um, and so that's why I think it's, it's tough to have, a monarchy, but I guess if you have a smaller, uh, more manageable population, even then you're talking about France. I mean, they, of course they had less population, but they, they didn't have any automation. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, thousands and thousands of individual decisions. And then, you know, the logistics of going to war were in a lot of ways easier, but a lot of ways harder because you had to have so much stuff that you had to bring with you. Mm -hmm. And it took you so long to transport it. And, um, uh, and the storage capabilities didn't exist because they didn't have a refrigeration at that point. Well, I mean, so anyway, even, kind of even looking at like things like the, the Holy Roman Empire, where you have, you know, just so many individual, you know, smaller, you know, subdivisions within this big thing. It's, you know, it's like baffling. I don't know if you've looked at like old maps of like Germany and stuff like from around this time period. But it's just like tiny, just individual little states, essentially. And it's like, you know, right. how would the king who supposedly has control over all these things know everything that's going on in every hundred of these little subdivisions? And I think that's right. part of the reason why they value wisdom. Right. Yeah, I think wisdom is just like a divine, you know, decision making power or something. Because yeah. they, they can't they can't be wise enough to know the answer. You don't even know what the questions are. Yeah. Most exactly. Of anyway. All right. Sorry to the interruption. I want to know your thoughts. That was, that, was, that was a good interruption. He then goes on to say that civilization is good in itself. A good society is prosperous and cheerful. Uh, people aren't overworked, they're not burdened by taxation, and they're not frightened by arbitrary and irrational laws. Uh, but what makes tr society truly civilized is the level of learning uh, that it fosters. So really one of the, the chief goals of a society should be to foster learning. Uh, and in this, he says that warfare is terrible because it is chemical to learning uh, and that the project of killing one's enemies is directly at odds with the prospect of living in a community governed by reason. Uh, so this is kind of where his pacifism comes in. Like if we want a nation governed by reason, if we want a learned population, we can't be going to war all the time. We have to be at peace for any of this to happen. And I think he's pretty spot on there, uh, especially yeah, at times that. like this when, you know, everybody kind of had to take part in a war. It's more of a practical consideration of, yeah. of the effectiveness of war in a, in a society and, and uh, how you can't, uh, you can't, yeah, correct. Yeah it's, yeah, it's it's different. It wasn't even a moral argument from the guy, <laughs> really, at its heart. Mm -hmm. He then goes on to say that the prince needs the arts of peace. Uh, and he brings up the familiar classical guidelines. Um, but in that, he brings up a discussion of punishment that is somewhat unusual um, because he says that where there are two ways of securing compliance, we should choose the gentler as persuasion leaves the chastised person a free man, but brutality leaves him hostile. Uh, and he also says that we should have institutions to house the idle due to age and sickness. So we shouldn't just, you know, put them in prison for for being unemployed, as was apparently um, a practice that was done at the time. If you weren't working, you know, go to jail. Um, oh yeah, I mean they they had I mean in in modern in in the United States they had debtors prisons, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, and that's a uh, uh, you know you couldn't pay your bill you, you couldn't you couldn't there was no such thing as bankruptcy yeah they put you in jail until somebody would pay pay for the debt mm -hmm. and then they'd sit there for a long time yeah and they had draconian punishments for stealing food man I mean <laughs> you could steal anything they you know it, 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 it could be in some cir circumstances death. Yeah, you know, for being a thief, it's crazy. It is crazy. But I, 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 I did like the summary where he says, uh, uh, that that few people beg by preference." And I think in his society, it's probably true. Yeah. But um, your mother and I just had a conversation the other day. Where were we at? We we're driving along. We're at the intersection, and she's she's oh yeah, we're we're going up in St. Louis County, mm -hmm. and she kind of looks around. And she says, "Oh, there's usually a uh, a guy here uh, that's asking for money." Uh, at that particular intersection, but of course we're going up on a weekend, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it has this day off. <laughs> and uh, and, she, and you know, of course, you, you know your mother's sweeter than I am, and she she's she's you know making a, a very good argument that you know if this guy just had the opportunity for for a job and and maybe the help he needs, and he he wouldn't have to be out there begging and mm -hmm. 
and I, and I said, um, I don't know of a business that's not hiring now, number one. And number two, he seems to have a job already because he's there like clockwork. <laughs> you know, he's he's got his work hours. That's his, he has, that's he has the initiative. He has, you know, yeah, the, the mindset. <laughs> He's doing the cost benefit analysis. Now that's not true of maybe necessarily all of them, but um, but the examples are abundant, at least in this area, mm-hmm. of of the I call them panhandlers, you know, the guys at the intersections that that uh, you know are walking away with literally rolls of cash, mm-hmm. and uh, they're not paying taxes on that. It's not reportable. Yeah, getting in their new cars and driving off to their place. Indeed, uh, it's cynical, but uh, some people do choose to that line of work and some people choose to be homeless you know yeah. but but I, th- I think that's a minority of them um i think the vast majority are people who have serious mental health issues and usually a combination of that and, and drug uh, abuse and addiction issues yeah which is, which is a different more intractable problem which i don't think well they would have the mental health issues i mean it's kind of universal through time but they wouldn't necessarily have the drug addictions. They'd have alcohol. I don't know what other kind of drugs they would have had in that era. They certainly wouldn't have had cocaine. Well, they might have had cocaine at that point. I Heroin think opium is around. soon. Opium is soon. Yeah. Oh, that's the big one that's coming yeah. up. But Yeah, that would be a, a big deal. And uh, they had the opium dens in China. Mm-hmm. That's what brought that whole society down low. You yeah. know, the, the, the British uh, exploited that brilliantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, but that's a whole different subject. Yes, that is. Going back to Erasmus. Um, he's also, you know, talking about idleness. He's not very, you know, praising of idleness. You, you know, you shouldn't just go around, you know, being idle. And he calls being a soldier uh, the worst form and the most dangerous form of idleness. Is he kind of defining yeah. idleness as somebody who's just, you know, constantly in service of another person, um, kind of servants and things like that. Um, he says that, uh, you know, being a soldier causes the total destruction of anything worthwhile and opens up a cesspit of everything that is evil, um, which is a very harsh condemnation of, um, of soldiers. I have to say that's, that's pretty rough. Well, I guess, you know, in, in his time of almost, um, continuous warfare, it, it would have been pretty frustrating to live in that society where mm-hmm. it, it's obviously so wasteful for the, for the soldiers too, you know, yeah. that they, their entire life is devoted just to, you know, destruction and killing people. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it is just a waste if, if you have an alternative. Yeah. He goes on to attack marital alliances and wars. He says, even if there are just wars, we should do everything in our power to not fight them. He says, in a world of continuous warfare, no rights are safe. So he says that Mm -hmm. we should prioritize securing most of our rights through peaceful negotiation rather than to trying to secure all of our rights by war, Uh, which I think is an interesting look at things, which I mean, I mean, fair enough. I think that's that is that is true enough. Yes. Uh, he then brings up the, the question of why we are so inclined towards war. And in this, he blames the clergy, actually. Uh, he says that it's really been fomenting warfare and that the Holy Roman Empire is now essentially the Habsburg dynastic empire. And you have all these different factions constantly at war. Um, and he goes on to say that if Christians must fight, they should fight the Turks, uh, but only if they can institute Christian peace. Uh, and in this, he also blames hostility uh, that stems from nationalism with people hating each other just based on their nationality kind of coming to the forefront here. And he says, you know, why does a Scot hang on Eng- hate an Englishman other than just being English? And he says, there's no other reason. It's just, that's why. Well, the English are pretty offensive. So <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> well, the Scots, the Scots had some grievances, but, uh, yes. but uh, not against every Englishman though. Yes. You know, yes. mm-hmm. that's what he's talking about. This is just a different form of racism, really. Mm-hmm. He then, you know, moving on from this work, he later wrote a self-mocking serio uh, comic tract called The Praise of Folly in 1509, and it begins with a personified folly uh, complaining that nobody makes speeches in her honor. And I liked uh, what he says here. I'm going to read from the book. As she says, this is very unfair, seeing how devotedly they follow her every whim, so she will make a speech in praise of herself. This she does with the aid of her allies, intoxication, deep sleep, ignorance, and stupidity. This enables Erasmus to mock contemporary social, religious, and political life, while saying that since it is only folly talking, it isn't to be taken seriously. No commentator has been able to decide just what he was up to that surely would have given Erasmus pleasure. In part, he may simply have enjoyed the intellectual exercise of writing from the standpoint of sheer foolishness. I feel like this is also something that you could really get behind, arguing from the point of view of stupidity. That's really in my wheelhouse. I I, I do like to do that. Um, (laughs) And sometimes I do it on the podcast, I think. I, I think you absolutely do. 
Uh, he goes on to say that folly attacks uh, the corrupt and spiritually bankrupt church and the useless drones who lecture on logic in universities. Uh, so two very big, you know, uh, powers there that he's attacking. He right. says that the masses are trapped in the flesh and they see only illusions. He reminds the readers that Christianity took a view that common sense would think insane. Uh, talking here about religion, he's, you know, why, what is the point of, of being a Christian? And he kind of concludes that people who seem insane to the world might see a deeper truth. And he says the truth of Christianity might be the same truth that Plato had enunciated. And he also ends by saying that the church was filled with corrupt and greedy hangers-on uh, and was no longer needed, um, at least in that form. And he seems, uh, and he is now seen as an inspiration to both Protestant and Catholic reformers, uh, which I thought was interesting. You know, he he appeals to both of them in a way, which I think you know is fair enough. Yeah. There's a lot of overlap, and um, and when you're talking about like taking absurd positions, uh, last night I was I got in a discussion with some friends, and and uh, one of them works for a Lutheran organization, mm. and uh, we were talking about communion and the different uh, beliefs between the two. And then there's a there was a Methodist uh, that is hostile to Catholicism, oh. overtly hostile to Catholicism. So I'm talking to the Lutheran. And uh, we're talking, you know, the, 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 you know, a friendly conversation about the, the, you know, the, the, the philosophy between Lutherans and Catholics with their community are pretty close. And, um, and then, um, uh, and the Lutheran says, well, the, 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 you know, the, the Methodist, he was going to say, you know, kind of reference the, bring the Methodist person into the discussion with the Methodist. I said, ah, F the Methodists. <laughs> <laughs> we Catholics and Lutherans got to stick together against those damn Methodists. Uh, so uh, that I thought that was funny. Um, Methodist, not so much. Luther laughed. Luther yes. laughed. Luther and I thought that was very funny. Anyway, that so, kind of reminds me. What What are the clubs I'm in up here? Uh, we always start with with a, uh, a prayer for every meeting, um, and of course, it's it's a mix of, of different faiths in there. There's a few Catholics and a lot of Protestants, um, and one of the the Catholics. Um, Nelly well, with the Hail Mary. Hail Mary every time. Yep, yep that's exactly <laughs> what he does. Almost almost always, he'll say a prayer. He'll say like. Um, uh, cause he'll volunteer to pray fa fairly often uh, and I'll say a prayer, you know, somewhat, you know, short, you know, thank us for, thank you for calling us together. And then they'll end with like a glory be or a hail Mary <laughs> every once in a while. He's feeling nice. And he'll end with an, our father, but he'll pull out like, yeah. some, sometimes he's pulled out like really long Catholic prayers that I don't even know. Like, yeah. like just, I think despite everybody. Well, you know, the hail Mary, I don't know why some, uh, Protestant religions, I mean, they, of course they think that we worship, uh, Mary as like a demigod. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there is a, you know, some truth to that, you know, uh, that criticism, I guess, depending on how you look at the emphasis of it, but the hail Mary is almost a direct quote from the Bible, yeah. you know, where, where the, the archangel comes down and announces that. I mean, it's, it's right out of the, uh, it's almost the entire prayer is almost a, a, a quote. It's, it's certainly the hail Mary full of grace. Anyway. Yes. So, what did yeah. you think of a, of Erasmus overall? What, what were your opinions, I, ideas? I enjoyed it. I mean, uh, you know, I was like a good satire, but I mean, the satire, it doesn't give you a whole lot of meat on the bones as far as uh, political philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a more mocking what not what is not rather than what is. Um, I like his his arguments against the the just war theory, which is, uh, OK, it's kind, of, it's kind of part of it is kind of OK, so what? You know, it's still it's just, war is still hell. And so even if there is a way to have a just war in theory, um, you, you know, you, you debase yourself and the opposite side if you go on a, a war to punish the, you know, the sins of the opponent and it's unproductive and, and it doesn't benefit anybody ultimately. So, you know, the, the kind of a more practical argument against it, which always resonates with me. Um, so, I, you know, and, and the focus on peace is interesting in a time of war which I guess makes sense, but it, you know, like, you know like we talked about earlier, it's kind of dangerous to, to say a good King is someone who abhors war. And, and, you know, the guy you're talking to about it is the guy who is, you know, making war. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, 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 uh, it's courageous. And uh, I like a lot of it. What do you think? Yeah. I liked it a lot. I think he's, he's kind of an example of general overall humanist philosophy mm. too i think he's just a good you know all around encompassing because we go into some detail about you know what he, what he says here but I, I like what he says about you know seeking for wisdom and learning being sort of the the goal of society and stuff like that uh, and i can mm. see where he's coming from with the pacifism i think he's just a good example of overall what the humanists thought on things so uh, i'm glad that yeah. this, this section was was so so detailed 
Yeah, and I, I really enjoy the argument that, hey, you know, if we're going to go to war, we shouldn't fight each other. We should just kill all those damn Turks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't but, only we, but only we can come to a, a Christian peace. So we have to conquer him. All right, can we conquer him and make him Christians? All right, let's go. But if we can't, then let's not bother. And we can't beat him and make him all Christians. Uh, <laughs> and it's a waste of time. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly what he was getting at, but um, well, there might be I'm an a, element of that in there. I'm uh, elaborating on his argument yes, for modern, of modern listeners. Of course. <laughs> Get the Turks. <laughs> Moving on to Sir Thomas More, uh, who Alan Ryan said was more of the focus of this chapter. Uh, and this is also... isn't, isn't he the patron, one of the patron saints of lawyers, maybe? I think so. But he also really liked to, didn't he, didn't he, I thought he advocated for the, the death of heretics. You yes, know, like he, he, he was not, he was not like Mr. Morality in a modern sense, or really, I don't think even then, but he finally made the, was it was so, you know, so-called yeah. right decision as far as saying that you know, the king can't uh, just assert himself as the head of a church. Yeah. Um, and I think wasn't it over a fight over he wanted to mm-hmm. yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna get into that another here. marriage and, and all that kind of stuff well uh, foreshadowing I mean, come foreshadowing it by what I'm about to say right now in these couple oh, of then days. you skip over it and go to the next thing ah, I want I'm gonna mention my notes here uh um, right, he was born in 1474 and was one of the cleverest men of his age um and he had a huge skill as a lawyer which led him into politics in the Tudor court became the Speaker of the House of Commons in the 1520s and succeeded the disgraced Cardinal Wolsey as Lord Chancellor in 1529. He was later convicted of treason when he refused to swear the oath acknowledging the King's supremacy as head of the Church of England. So he was ordered to be executed by Henry VIII in 1535, and knowing how unpopular the execution was going, execution was going to be, he forbid him to make a speech on the scaffold in justification of his conduct. And so he kind of dies with the good quote, I die the King's good servant, but God's first. Um, Kind of a good opening line or good ending lines, I guess, as far as they go. Yeah, I I, I mean, yes, in a sense, it it shows a consistency of thought and Mm -hmm. belief. But, um, you know, I don't know if I if I respect somebody who's going to obey the order to not give a last speech. Mm, Yeah, that's fair. But I guess it doesn't matter which was more powerful. Mm. Saying you're just doing your duty all along, including telling the king he can't be the head of the church. And you're still following orders. And so I, you know, I'm sure that resonated with a lot of people at the time. And, Very and Socratesian. Correct. Yeah, I've been I've been ordered to die. So I'm going to and die and I've been ordered not to say and my my reasons why my death order is wrong. So I'll just keep it myself. Yeah. Which I, I guess I should respect more. Mm-hmm. Maybe but I would have liked a speech. Yeah. You know? yeah. I'm I'm uh well, I don't know. You never know what you're going to do at that point. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I like to think I'm fairly confident that I would, I would give a speech. Mm. You know. Yeah, I think you would too. Mm. I think I think you absolutely would. It, it'd be hard to pass up that kind of opportunity. I know. I know. Because when, once you don't take the opportunity, you never get it again. <laughs> that is true. That, that you're not getting any repeats on that one. <laughs> you're really. At the end of the line, that's the end yeah, of the season. That is, so, that is it. We got a grand finale. <laughs> Going back to uh, to Thomas More, uh, Alan Ryan makes the point that there's a big contrast between his skepticism about the political and social life and his readiness to accommodate himself to the du- brutality and duplicity of Tudor politics. He says, had he not died a martyr to Catholicism, he would have had the reputation of a man who could justify anything his royal master did. Uh, which is mm-hmm. interesting because he had, you know, kind of a, a people pleaser attitude towards the whole monarchy. You know, he was so heavily involved in politics, which sounds about like politicians today, just excusing, you know, whatever, you know, the person in charge is doing now. Um, right. But, it wasn't just a people pleaser. It was a king pleaser. Yes. So he was he was finding uh, legal and moral justifications for almost anything the king was doing mm-hmm. up to that point. But I guess everybody has a, has a limit. <laughs> yeah, uh, apparently. I mean, it finally it's, hit it's, his it's, and he's like, well, yeah, I'm going to do that. So, yeah, it would have. And that's that's why he's so complicated. And and I guess you know if if you're anybody who's involved in that kind of politics, especially as it goes on from these eras, you know you, you give up something. You know you make compromises. Absolutely. And so the Utopia was Moore's best known work, um, but it is puzzling uh, because the word is his own coinage, um, and you can either you know read it as Utopia, which means no place, or as Eutopia, which means the good place. Uh, and also the main river on the island of Utopia is Anandrus, or Waterless, and the narrator's Raphael. 
Hithudias, um, which roughly translates to something like absurd. So really, this whole story is about a place that contradicts itself um, from an unreliable narrator. So it's unclear, you know, how much of this was his actual ideas and how much of this was just, you know, mocking whatever these ideas were. Hmm, I don't know that that's do you think that do you think there's a possibility he was mocking the ideas? I don't know if he was would, necessarily mocking, but I don't know how seriously you should take them as his own political convictions. You hmm. seem confused. No, I'm not confused. I'm thinking. I, I'm thinking that that it it was something that he thought could be an ideal state, hmm. but now whether or not it could actually be in yeah. existence. Yes. That whether it can exist, I think there's a there's a, there's a, a definitely an open question of whether he even thought that it could exist because I think it I think it really is like this is no place it's not a place that has ever been or will ever be but this is what we consider utopia yes. which is you know the perfect society mm -hmm. uh, if if he had you know unlimited power to to make it so I think yeah maybe that's that's a good point I think that's a it's a good distinction there. Um, but the first book of the Utopia is a long prologue where Moore denounces the way that sheep have consumed men as much of England's uh, economy at the time was based on the wool trade and sort of the, the terrible things going on there. Um, and also the injustice of executing unemployed uh, for theft and the wickedness of monarchs who rob their subjects. There's also a discussion of whether Moore should return to his life of study or remain in public service. So kind of an autobiographical, you know, looking at contemporary times, what's going on. And then he moves into his discussion of Utopia. Right. What were the, the, the main features of Utopia? Uh, well, the first and biggest one was the abolition of money. And so they lived in a communist society where everyone must work for six hours a day uh, and families draw on the common stock for necessities. But he goes on to say that work is an inherent good for its discipline and producing that which you need. Uh, so it's not like work is a terrible thing that you are subjected to. You, know, you should be happy to take part in work. He also denounced capital punishment for theft. This is excessive harshness brutalized both criminals and non-criminals. Says you know thieves become slaves instead in this utopia, uh, and they oh, serve much life. better. Yeah, not much better, uh, mm. especially because they serve a life sentence of hard labor. Um, though the sentences are commuted sometimes for good behavior, uh, but they don't suffer any brutal treatment. But they do work longer days than the general population. So, yeah, so like, uh, hey, wait a second, didn't, didn't I pay off that candy bar I stole ten years <laughs> ago yet? Jesus, I've been working you know twelve hour days every day for the past you know ten years. And the answer is, what are you talking about? There's no money. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't paid it back. Shut up, slave. Uh, yeah, and uh, Star Trek is a is a abolition of money utopia in the future. Is it? I you didn't know, know that. Yeah, they, they don't have any money. Oh, interesting. And, uh, Star Trek, they discussed that a little bit tangentially in Star Trek Next Generation. Mm, I did not. Um, and and it doesn't make sense why you know, and, and they're all working on this thing, and, and you wonder why why are they wanting to work so much? You know yeah. they because there's no reward. That is a good question. It's an Except for more question. work. It's, it's an unending, unending uh, mountain of more work. It just keeps going up and up. So the more work you do, the more work you have to do. Mm. I would think they would have more uh, people that were coasting. Mm. Because what's the difference? You, you should know, take you know, that up with the uh, the writers of Star Trek. I think they'd love to hear your opinions. Isn't Gene Roddenberry dead? I Didn't he the don't creator? know. I have no mm. idea. I could not mm. tell you. I'm, it's been discussed before. It's, this is not a unique thought to me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure, sure he's brilliant. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he also which says is, that there's... Which is a failure of all communist systems. Mm, yes. Yeah. Uh, share and share alike. Well, well, first of all, the people in power don't share everything, but, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. Yes, back to Thomas More. Uh, he says that there's almost no central government in the utopia. The towns are all the same size and layout. And the groups of households choose leaders, and these form a council that chooses a mayor of the township. And then from there, there are a few laws and no lawyers, as everybody <laughs> is, you know, mostly just intellectuals who study liberal arts rather than rob their neighbors. So everybody's too busy learning to actually, you know, uh, steal from people, which I'm not sure if that really holds up as a defense against thieves, but um, evidently it would work in this society. Well, and, and the idea of a lawyer isn't isn't necessarily because somebody stole. I mean, you're going to have disputes. How, yeah. how do you deal with competing claims? Mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you deal with, uh, you know, if you're in this council and you get a house and you put up a fence for your sheep, mm -hmm. what if your neighbor says, hey, you put your fence 10 feet in, over the property line? Well, who's going to decide that? If you don't have any lawyers, I guess we arm wrestle for it. 
Something tells me that in his justification of everything that the king did, he did not have some good experiences with lawyers in his time. If I had to guess, that's why there's no lawyers in Utopia. Yeah, I guess. I guess if you had, yeah, and it, and it is a no place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is no good place without lawyers or something similar to lawyers yes. to help guide through the, the system and to write the laws and all that kind of stuff. Yes. He then also turns to religion, um, and it seems to prefigure Unitarianism in that the Utopians call their god Mithras. Uh, and there's essentially, you know, acceptance of everything. But the general tenets of, of Mithraism is that there is a God. The universe is divinely ordained for human life and attaining of eternal happiness and death is not to be feared. There's an absolute ban on intolerance, as many beliefs were practiced in Utopia uh, and that violent attempts at converting others are put down as breaches of the peace. Um, but along with that, atheists are tolerated but cannot proselytize in public or hold office. And Raphael, who's the narrator telling all of this, uh, ends the story by stating that Utopia has been converted to Christianity. Uh, So a little bit of, you know, his his Christian ideals going in there. But, you know, the the Utopia originally was this place where everything is tolerated, but now it's all Christian. And that might be better in a way. Yeah, because we got rid of them damn atheists. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I'm sure that's what he was thinking. Um, He then goes on to say that the priests have a large role in warfare as utopians uh, rather secure victory by deceit and bribery than by force. But they are happy to wage wars to free others from dictatorial governments, but do not wage war for their own self-interests besides self-defense. And so priests minimize destruction. Uh, They prevent uh, the army from killing defeated foes. They protect the fallen, and they have the authority to declare a battle ended. Um, I thought that was funny. He says, you know, they can end a battle by saying it's over. I don't know how that would convince either side to stop fighting, but evidently it worked in, in this utopia. Well, they wear striped shirts and have literally loud whistles. Mm. You know, they, everybody stops stabbing each other in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, time's up. Everybody back to you. Oh, half time. We got we got to consult with our coach really quick. Um, then, then, they, then they get their priests out there to, to connive and lie and bribe to end the war. And that's, yeah. that's morally superior. I don't know what the hell is that all about. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it, gets, it gets a little worse uh, because yeah. that, he says that they were unwilling to have their own people killed in war. Uh, and their massive wealth, which he doesn't really explain, but they are very rich, even though they don't have any money. Um, there's massive... no money and they're communists, but all of a sudden they have massive wealth to hire mercenaries to murder yes. their enemies. Yes. And that's better. And they've worked out that there is such a high death rate among their mercenaries that and that that means that they will only have to pay a small proportion of them. So it's very economically sound as well. Uh, they Sounds like to... they'd be able to recruit a lot of people for that. <laughs> they, they, they have unlimited fake money. <laughs> and then uh, a high kill rate. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to join that army. Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. And that's uh, another reference to um, uh, what you would call it, uh, Hunger Games, you know, where they have mm-hmm. the the district people murdering each other while they just party in the capital city. So he's 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 doing the the capital city utopia. Yes, exactly. Um, he then goes on to say, uh, kind of summarizing everything, that the utopia isn't a blueprint for pacifism and an abolition of social ranks, nor for religious disestablishment. Uh, he says that the comic elements protect more from being labeled a dissident um, and the text from being treated as politically desirable. So he kind of says, you know, it's all kind of framed as a joke. You know, it's it's hard to tell, you know, where he's serious about this and where he's not. Uh, and it reads now as a cautionary tale of uh, of the desire for the perfect society leading to totalitarianism. Utopians can't travel without pre, uh, permission. Premarital intercourse is penalized by a lifelong prohibition on marriage, and everyone is acutely conscious of being under the eye of someone else. Uh, but reading here from the book, uh, he says, it seems much too high a price to pay, even for the peace and security on offer. We should not assume that more would share our doubts. Writing from the little room in the Tower of London where he was awaiting trial and execution, he did not complain of his loss of liberty, but expressed gratitude for the simplification of his existence. This was no doubt a gallant attempt to comfort his family. He had an enviably happy marriage and was greatly loved by his children. It also reflected the hankering after a life free of earthly concerns that an admirer of Plato should have felt. So interesting um, that this totalitarian, excuse me, totalitarianism um, is kind of seen as a good thing, a comforting thing to Thomas More as he's, you know, waiting to die. But um, I don't know how I'd feel about that. Yeah, this, um, when I read uh utopia back mm-hmm. in my college days that's when i realized i was wasting my life studying philosophy <laughs> <laughs> we had a we had a section on utopias and we read this and we read other utopian thoughts uh, is, and i came to the conclusion this is just complete total bs 
Did you read Why? the new, Did you read the new Atlantis? Because I was reading this and I could have sworn I read the Utopia, but then I looked through my books and I realized I actually read Milton's New Atlantis, which is a similar sort of deal. No, I, I read the Utopia. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and and uh, so yeah, I've, I, and we studied other. I, I don't know what other. I can't remember what other utopian theories there were. And my professor was real excited about him. <laughs> you know, utopian thought. And, and he was like, you know, he published stuff about utopian thought and how beneficial it was. And I just thought, this is just such a waste of time. And, you know, it's, and, and I don't really believe that. I mean, I, I believe that it, it's like, like I was, um, when I was talking about this. I was thinking about the other day, you know, when, when you, when you get down to it, um, there's no real reason why you can't have uh, a society with no crime yeah. because everybody could just wake up in the morning and decide they're going to commit a crime mm-hmm. and it stops, you know, but practically speaking, how do you, des- how do you, how do you get there? You know, mm-hmm. if it's, it's a millions and millions of individual decisions and a lot of them aren't even thought out wow. very much, you know, especially crimes of passion or violence and that type of thing. And, and so I think it's valuable to, to, to consider the possibilities in a perfect world and then you kind of design something to get you clo- the cl- as close as possible to that perfect world where there's no crime. You know, how do we get there? So I think it, that is valuable, but it's just such when you when you have a whole system, you know, it's I just think it's such a waste of time. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, go ahead. That's why I kind of like you know what he said about you know the two different meanings of utopia. You can either read it you know using depending on which you know Greek prefix you use, it's either no place or good place. You know, he even acknowledges. This is no place. This cannot actually exist. And I think that's a problem um, with a lot of thought today. I went to a, um, I, I told you about this, I, I don't think on the recording, but I went to a, a communist meeting um, mm, to, to learn about, you know, uh, of course, you know, the, the the benefits of Marxism, because I thought it would be be entertaining to, to see what they had to say. Uh, and one of the points that they made um, in, in counter to, to some question that somebody asked, you know, isn't this utopian? Isn't this, you know, how, how is this possibly achieved? Um, and one of the communists said, well, if it is a utopia, isn't that like the best thing? You know, even if we can't actually achieve that, shouldn't we be taking steps in that direction? Mm-hmm. And I think, well, yes, if it could be achieved, but it can't be achieved. You know, even if, even if we agree that this is the best possible system, you do have to acknowledge that there is no way we are going to get to that system. So we should not be pushing for it because it's not possible. Yeah, I don't know that I agree with that line of reasoning. I think that that it's more basic that even the communists don't believe that the communist system is what they want, because... Yeah. Like I think we even talked about this. You know, what I think you should do if you go to another meeting is say, okay, everybody pull their money. Make sure, first of all, you only bring like $2. But everybody here in this room should put their money on the table. We divide it equally. And um, and you have a nice watch, so you need to put that in the, in the mix. You know, nobody really wants communism. Nobody really wants equality. Yeah. They want more for them. And and if it, and they, they call equality, they, they call taking stuff from other people that they don't have uh, equality. Mm. But if they're at the top or there are people below them, they don't believe in equality anymore. They mm. just don't, you know, none of them do. Um, but if, but the only ones that are true devoted communists are the ones that have nothing. Yeah. I mean, nothing. And they, and, or, but, but really most of them don't have anything because their parents have everything and they don't have to worry about anything because all they have to do is go to mom and dad's and they get stuff, you know, and, and uh, anyway. So yeah. I, I think, I think I disagree with you. I think, I think it's, it's, it's okay to strive for perfection, mm. but we have to acknowledge you're never going to get there. Yeah. But you just have to know what the, what, what is the perfection you're trying to get? And, and they're not really striving for communism. Mm. They're 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 striving for what is it in effect totalitarianism that when they're in charge, you know, they want to control everything. They want to decide. They want to be forcing people to do or not do things. They're not really looking for a society in which we all have enough and everybody's happy. Mm-hmm. Because if they did, they wouldn't be Marxists. Because yeah. there's never been a Marxist system that even came close to achieving that. Mm-hmm. And so sure. they 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 don't. They don't really want what they say they want. Mm-hmm. They're lying to themselves. I don't, I don't yeah. think they're lying to us. I think they're I think, lying to themselves. I think my big problem with it, like speaking specifically about communism, is that in order to get there, I think we would go to to a system that I think they would agree is almost worse than capitalism, too. Because you have almost. To go through, well, well, that, that, that 
I'm, they, I'm, would agree. they would agree. I think, yeah. But to go through socialism where, where the state owns everything. And I think, you know, if we're, if we're striving to get there in order to get to communism, I think we'd agree that that is still worse. I think to go down into that dip to try to get back up to perfection, we shouldn't even try to go down to that dip if we think that perfection is, is, is not possible to achieve. Right. And, and it doesn't make sense because you would, you would have to take the opposite t- track. Mm-hmm. You'd have to get a super successful free market system with the wealth that is generated from that to get to a point where we all just say, you know what? Everybody already has enough. Mm-hmm. You know, the people that have a lot more don't need any more, yeah. you know? And that, that's really, that's the only way to get to communism is through extreme wealth for everyone. If everybody already has extreme wealth, and abundance and don't have to work for a lot. It'd be like, it's kind of like, um, um, what you would call it? Um, the matrix, but without being a pod people, you know, like if, if everything was automated and everything was taken care of and you didn't have to work, you just think all day and, you know, play uh, pickleball <laughs> or whatever your heart's arts desire, then you're, you're really close to not needing money or, or at least sharing it equally among everybody because everybody's going to have too, too much to have. Yeah, that's the only way you get to communism. Mm-hmm. You don't get through to communism, a successful communist state through rationing and scarcity, uh, because then people will hold on to what they need to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, so that they're wrong about the end goal, and they're wrong about how to get there. And yeah. they're exactly they're going the exact opposite dis- direction they should be going. Mm-hmm. They should be figuring out, okay, what 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 system generates the most wealth for the most people capitalism let's do that and that way we can get more people that are not in poverty yeah. you know then once we get everybody if we because if we can get everybody out of poverty which is, is is a theoretical possibility like true poverty where they're not starving um you know because we've eliminated a lot of that in the united states i mean we've gone mm-hmm. tremendous strides and, and worldwide i mean the, the the free market capitalist system in the last 200 years has lifted more people out of poverty than in the history of the world. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing. So, but yeah. they, that's, they don't really want that. Mm-hmm. They don't want that land of abundance and lack of need. They want power. Yeah. That's well, what they want. well, one of the, the big things that I was thinking, you know, the entire time throughout this presentation, they brought up something that I'd never heard described about communism. Um, so this was a gap in my, my communist knowledge. Um, but, you know, we I brought up the point, you know, because I mentioned, you know, a, a farmer, you know, was, you know, the oppressed because, you know, he doesn't own anything. He's just working on this land. But then, the you know, the farmer above him is the oppressor and things like that. So I brought up the point of, you know, well, well what if it is just like a farmer that we have, you know, today in today's economy when, you know, they're not the richest. They are, you know, a lower class person. They just happen to own this land. Are they the oppressed or they the oppressor because they have so many people above them and not really anybody below them. But they do own these assets. And um, so the, the communists mentioned this concept of the petty bourgeoisie. Uh, which is somebody who is neither oppressed nor oppressor um, and kind of exists in this middle ground. Um, and so what they kind of ended up describing was just a lower, a middle and an upper class. And so I was thinking right. the entire time throughout their presentation, why shouldn't the goal just be to increase that middle class, that petty bourgeoisie, as you described, so that nobody's oppressed and nobody's uh, the oppressor? Like, wouldn't that be what we're trying to achieve anyway, instead of, you know, going through yeah. the whole, yeah. you know, socialism into communism business? Well, the short answer is that we hate the bourgeoisie. And we really hate the petty bourgeoisie because they don't really know what's good for them. And we got to get rid of them. We have to get rid of them so we can achieve the justice that communism will bring and Marxism because they're the enemies. Yes, they are the That's enemies. The yes. That's, That's enough true. about communism. I, I, I guess we got there from utopias. Um, but moving on to, to you always get to communism and socialism from utopia. That is true. Utopia. That is true. Moving on to Montaigne, the last uh, thinker in this section, very short, short section on him. Uh, he, he says that Montaigne's essays uh, touch only indirectly on political organization. They're more of attempts to investigate the human psyche. He says that man is a mystery to himself, uh, but uh, patience, self-control and caution and taking anything for granted are essential for self-sustainability. Now, Montaigne was born in 1533. He took part in the French Civil War's of the mid-century, and he came from a noble family and studied law, and therefore became a counselor in the Bordeaux Parliament, uh, but found public dif- affairs distasteful. And he says that pol- politics is more to be feared for the dangers uh, than enjoyed for its opportunities. He says that while rulers are essential, monarchy is best, and good rulers eschew the search for military go- glory and try to build uh, good public morals on the most possible form of Christianity. 
and therefore the greatest goods are friendship, a quiet mind, and the study of philosophy and religion. Um, and then he's sometimes credited um, as being ha having discovered the modern sense of individuality and the modern concept of private life. And his essays can be said to be the first uh, modern autobiographies. And so he concludes this section by saying, and here we begin to see the emergence of a new conflict between the private and the public, not the traditional tension between self-interest and public spirit, or the Christian tension between the concerns of the here and now and those of the hereafter, or the platonic tension between the church for truth and doing our duty to our fellows, but the distinctively modern conflict between the pleasures of intimate relationships, domestic happiness, the quiet contentment of living our own lives in our own way, and the pleasures, equally real but utterly different, of public life. The door opens to a new reading of the tension between man and citizen. Uh, so this new difference here, you know, where does the individual's life fit in? Where does the individual's happiness fit in into this political system? You know, how do they enjoy society while also just doing what they want as well? And that's kind of one of the big questions that we'll be looking at going forward. Um, and it's good that Montaigne described that here. Um, a very, very important topic. What would you think about, about Montaigne? Uh, I, yeah, well, I, I like the uh, thought that politics is more to be feared for its dangers than enjoyed for its opportunities. But well, that's the truth, you know, and if you don't go into it, knowing that um then you're in for a rough ride mm -hmm. if you go oh this is gonna be great yeah. i'm going to do great things and be happy uh so i'm gonna get into politics <laughs> uh, you're on the wrong wrong path uh, go maybe do basket weaving or painting or something you'll have a much better <laughs> more productive life what'd you think so, of the, the 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 chapter overall though what were your opinions on uh, the humanists why don't you say first? I mean, I, I I like humanism as a concept. I I align myself a lot with you know the the desire to read a lot of old stuff and get what knowledge you can from there, and you know the focus on learning and education and things like that. I can really get behind that, um, and I do agree with a lot of these humanists that there is a lot of truth in the in the older works and things like that. You know, you do have to go and look for it, but I mean, it's it's still there and it's still uh, applicable to the current day. I don't know if I necessarily agree with like Pico's opinion that you know. By combining every single thing, then we can come to the ultimate truth. I just do think that there are kernels of truth in in just about you know everything uh, like that. So I like them a lot. Um, their political philosophies are kind of, I mean, middle of the road what we've been hearing a lot of. But I do like the 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 emphasis on the individual person, you know, on the the common person. Um, mm -hmm. You know, while they're addressing these kings, these princes, they're also mentioning, hey, you know, these people are people too. You know, you know, look out for your for your people, and, and you know. Their, their learning and their happiness and their peace should be what is to be desired, not necessarily your glory in battle and things like that. And I like that a lot. I agree. You agree? Yeah, I, don't really have, I don't really have anything to add. To mm. that. That's really very good. Thank good you. Synopsis. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yes, we'll be moving on to the Reformation uh, uh, next time. I don't know if you have any more thoughts on the humanists. Any any other rants you want to go on? No, I, I, I think I, I only have one or two this time. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's, so, that's, that's a good amount of rants. Yeah, I, I need to like, I need to cut back my rants. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like you just need to start writing down your rants. I think you I think you get a lot more more more. I don't know, bang for your buck by by writing everything down. I know you started that Substack and then wrote like two things and then stopped. Um, two and a half. Two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. You're mm. right. I just need to I need to not be so lazy. Mm. Uh, I think that's I've been problem. I've been wanting to to write down some stuff too, but I don't have any time. Well, I, I, I could find time, but yeah. I, I write so much um, for work. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost like I get tired of, of putting my thoughts on, on paper mm -hmm. or, you know, or typing it out. And the yeah. computer is really what we're doing. And I just kind of I, I just kind of want to back away from the computer when I get home. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to get up early and do it. So, I mean, and I don't know that anybody's ever going to read it. And I don't know if it has any value. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of problems that's that's a lot so, of problems. so it's hard to get motivated it's hard to get motivated for mm. to do something i i don't like the process uh, of writing because it's hard you know yeah uh it, it's work and i don't uh know that anyone would benefit from it including me so i have a hard time making time for that as opposed yeah. to just watching tv <laughs> <laughs> well, we should we should we should start an, uh, an unlimited opinions uh, sub stack and then direct all of our many listeners there Ooh. and then they can listen to it or our mm. website or something, something to put your, your, my thoughts down. 
Well, I still have the fear that the that my opinions expressed on this uh, podcast will come back uh, negatively towards you. So <laughs> the less content I am mm. uh, sharing, like co-authorship or some mm. sort of joint responsibility, I think the less of that, the better for you. Mm. Well, we can, not, we can make sure that whatever you write has your name on it and not mine. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's a, 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 it would have my byline for sure. Yes. That's mm-hmm. true. But yeah. uh, in today's day and age, you know, uh, as long as people understand that you're not responsible for anything I do, because I'm, I'm not, I'm not untouchable, meaning that, you know, that I, that I could, there could be consequent negative, negative consequences if I say a bunch of crazy things. Yes. Uh, but, you know, I'm at the stage of my career in my life that it's, it'd be hard. You know, mm-hmm. to really, really hit me hard, um, you know, but you're at the beginning, you know, yeah, that is so true. That, that's one of the hesitations I have with the joint thing. And then also you'd probably publish like two times as many articles as I would <laughs> make me aggravated. <laughs> you're really just worried about me showing you up. I think it's, I think it's a real problem. <laughs> But but speaking well, of, of people finding your thoughts, this is actually shaping up to to be, I think, the best month that that we've ever done in performance on the podcast. Is that right? In terms of downloads, yeah, it is. If we get four more downloads in like the next like forty eight hours or something, oh. um, it'll be the best month we've ever done. We're at like two hundred and thirty nine, I want to say. Wow. For the month of October. Considering that other podcasts get thousands and thousands yeah. of uh, listens every month. Um, it's all relative. <laughs> <laughs> we're working up. We're, we're still getting there. We're still in the right direction. Yeah, we're exactly. going to keep chugging along. By the time I'm 80 years old, we'll have uh, <laughs> we'll have 500 a month. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll be really making big figures there. <laughs> well, if I ever put pen to paper and, and I get published, then yeah, all of a sudden people, can... people want to research. Oh, mm-hmm. what is that brilliant Mark Bishop? Yeah, what do you think in that podcast? Really, it'll probably be people researching you, you know, 100 years from now. Huh. Uh, your early thoughts and the influence of his father on his early, early published. Uh, <laughs> and they could work. sit through 94 episodes now of us sitting around and talking for hours. Well, you know, and I'm making this, this is not a proper analogy, but wouldn't it have been great if you had recordings of Plato and Socrates? You know, not, not that we're Plato and Socrates, yeah. but I mean, can you imagine that? And, and, and so what people are doing now are not, I mean, not that this is so highbrow, but at least it's something. But really what people are doing are making TikTok videos or taking pictures of their food. You know, yeah. you could record all of your thoughts and, and 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 desires and dreams and your big ideas and have them saved for all eternity for generations in the, to, to come. And and what are you doing? You're posting a video of you twerking on the sidewalk. <laughs> you know? Oh, oh, there's great grandma. There's great grandma out there. I didn't know she had those tattoos. <laughs> you know, oh, that must have hurt. <laughs> that is uh, awful. Yeah, that yeah. that tattoo artist must uh must have had a, you know, like a, it must be ambidextrous or uh, you know, <laughs> to get at that angle. What an artist! <laughs> I think that's enough of that. I think I think yeah, that's well. Yeah. We're gonna have. I will say this. Uh, you know, my my experience in court, especially mm-hmm. in, in municipal court, where you know it's just traffic tickets, assaults, and you know, minor assaults, and, and domestics, and DWIs, you see so many women and mm-hmm. men, but but really, it's it, it seems, to, it really has gone on, everybody has tattoos, yeah, and they have big gargantuan tattoos, and I'm just, I'm looking forward to living long enough where I could see all these, grand, they're going to be grandmothers, or great-grandmothers, and have these huge snake tattoos going down their thigh you know like have you seen those 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 women that have the big fat thigh tattoos and then they have the calf tattoos and and the sleeves and all that and they're gonna be all wrinkled up and uh (laughs) i'm I'm just really looking forward to it you know we're getting to the point where you see a lot of them that are now grand grandmothers and you know into their their 50s certainly in 60s but really you don't see a lot of people that are over 60 now that are women that have tattoos Mm -hmm. unless they've got them more recently you know it's not like they got them in their youth so I'm really looking forward to the people that are 20 years old now and getting you know, living long enough to see them when they're when they're much older, uh, just for the entertainment value. Mm. So yeah, that, that's they, that's that's a good rant. How do you like that? Good rant. That was that was a weird rant. I mean, <laughs> you worked it in there, I guess. That was that was something. <laughs> um, all right. Any other closing thoughts? Do you want another one? I could I could come up with something. Save it for the next time. Well, <laughs> okay. whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I guess we should should wind things down. You've been listening to season four, episode 10 of Unlimited Opinions. I've been Adam Bishop. I'm still Mark Bishop. And you can, of course, follow us on Twitter at ULMTD Opinions. That's ULMTD Opinions on Twitter. All right. I guess I get working on my uh, Substack writing. Yeah, exactly. You definitely do. So do I. What should, what, what should my next rant be? I don't really have. Any I think rant. you should just write down exactly what you just said about tattoos and, and post them on, on Substack. <laughs> oh, that would get you thought. some some clicks. <laughs> there are a lot of people that have, have already uh, already thought of that. I think mm. I think it's unique, mm. but I am looking forward to it. It'll be fun. <laughs> Lovely. I wonder if by then it'll be okay to make fun of them. Like in the store, you know, you know, society changes so much. Maybe it'll be like socially acceptable to make fun of old people. I mean, I'll be older, <laughs> but but you know, hey, you you're ugly. You know, look at that you know, deformed, the deformed angel tattoo on your thigh. <laughs> Don't you cover that up, Grandma? <laughs> That's lovely. Thank, thank you for that. <laughs> now it looks like a gargoyle. That's an angel. <laughs> no, I haven't seen it. It's <laughs> a gargoyle, lady. I'm it's got be horse check tests. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> that's great. <laughs>